experience and the problems throughout the scientific community for since 1999 when I got dragged into it. One of the sub themes that really interests me are is what I would call the rise of dominance of the amateurs. And um, if you follow some of the scientific debates and blogs, they really occur mostly on the internet, not in the scientific journals. And amateurs are killing the experts in their own field of expertise. You don't seem to have gone the next step to do the mathematical analysis yourself. You feel confident enough to tackle the big guys. Are you thinking of that? Well, in order for me to do the mathematics myself, I would probably have to go back to university and take uh, and take a, a degree. In my, I have five degrees, but none of them happen to be mathematics. But one of my minors was in mathematics, and though I'm not saying this in order to, you know, to justify myself, I did lead the mathematics department in McGill and never got less than a hundred in any class I took. And spent a couple of years really thinking that maybe I should go into mathematics and doing all the problems. But this was some time ago. That's why I consulted my son. Now, I trust my son. He's a first grade scientist. He's a top mathematician. He did all the research that I would not have been capable of doing unless I went back and took another three or four years in order to produce a degree. I, and I believe that what he, the conclusions that he arrived at are veridical. As veridical, and he is a mathematician. And he's a top flight mathematician, and he is my boy, and we are very close, and he would not lie to me, and I would not lie to him. And so I trust the results he came up with, not only because they confirmed my own suspicions, but because I know the kind of scientist that he is. And you can, you can if you want, we can talk later, and I can send you to his articles in Science and Nature and so on. This guy is, this guy is great. And he really knows what he's talking about. So between the two of us, I think the conclusions that I arrive at are credible. I'm not saying that they're final, terminal, or irreversible, but they are credible, I believe. Uh, Robert, briefly. <laughs> okay, right, well, uh, there's, one, th there's uh, one interesting point you can focus on for climate change, and that's the position of Greenland. Because during the medieval warm period, it was possible to uh, run a uh, to run a uh, sort of European agricultural state in Greenland. And one thing you could do, which usually shuts them up, is uh, if you've got the passages in Old Icelandic where they name Greenland because it was green, and Vinland, which was probably in Newfoundland because it had wine, that usually can shut them up a bit. And I can send you the passages if you like as a sort of thing to pull out of your hat, because, uh, because you find people who know all, all this, uh, the people who claim to talk about climate who know all Icelandic is rather rare. So I'll, I'll be happy to send you that if you want to sort of uh, out of left field. Thanks, I'd be very pleased. I have, I have some passages about Greenland in the yeah. book, yeah. and of course, um, it, was, <laughs> it was called Greenland, it wasn't green. It was called Greenland because Eric the Red wanted to encourage people. I'm afraid from, that's not. Let me, let me finish. To encourage, from what I have read, to encourage people to emigrate to this particular place. But Greenland was indeed green at one point in its geological history. There's no there's no doubt about that. And this is known from ice core samples and isotopic uh, uh, radiocarbon readings from fossil fish. We know that it was green at one point. It's not going to melt now. And not only that, Arctic ice is now increasing. Uh, yes, that's true. But I'm uh, no, sorry, Fred. Uh, Fred, uh, they did bring this up. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sure sorry. What uh, happened, uh, what uh, happened Robert, with Greenland Robert, is he, the, the style of the sagas is very spare. He called it Greenland because okay. it was green. Can we it's talk not about this after the Robert, 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 we're going to move on to Tom. Yeah. Yeah, I very much enjoyed your talk. Uh, my name is Tom Harris with the International Climate Science Coalition. Um, yeah, and I think you're both right, actually, on Greenland. Uh, it was an advertising ploy, and it certainly was a lot greener. Uh, the Vikings were sailing on waters that are now covered with sea ice, so obviously it was considerably warmer. Um, my question to you is, we at the International Climate Science Coalition have identified what we think is the main issue, the main problem, which is preventing people uh, from across the political spectrum from properly looking at the data, and that is the left-right divide. I mean, it was brilliant PR for the alarmists to actually identify themselves as left wing and for the left to accept it. Of course, that became a, a very big problem because in the United States, you've got about a 50-50 divide between Republican and Democrat. 
So we're trying very hard to bridge the gap to actually be able to sell climate realism to the left by being nonpartisan. But I, I wonder if you had some suggestions as to how can you bring that enormous population of people who are not right wing over to actually look at the data properly? Is there a way to bridge the divide in your opinion? Tom, I think I've actually quoted you in my book. <laughs> I don't remember exactly, I mean, you know, I haven't read my book yet. I only wrote it, so <laughs> I'm not sure what's in it exactly. But, but, uh, but I do remember quoting you somewhere in that, in that book. It wasn't about this, this particular question, though. But it's, uh, <laughs> it's the kind of question that I find almost unanswerable, and if one tries to answer it, it could lead to terminal depression. Um, <laughs> Uh, interestingly, I don't know if this attaches to what you're saying and what you're asking. Interestingly, uh, Rasmussen did a poll in the United States recently about uh, global warming and how many people believe it is, if it exists, that it's AGW, that it's man-made, or that it's simply part of nature's inevitable cycles. And it turns out that, um, uh, if I remember correctly, 57% of the American populace believes that if there is global warming, it is part of nature's cycle, and only 19% think that it is man-made. So though there is a political divide between Republicans and Democrats, or right and left, there's a not a divide between those who believe that whatever is going on in the climate is simply a function of nature's habits, and those who believe that it is caused by man's nefarious activities. Um, I think the only thing we can do is do what we're doing, is continuing to talk, to write, to whether it's about global warming, or whether it's about Israel, or whether it's about the Palestinian myth, or whether it's about President Obama uh, and his Alinsky training, uh, whatever it is, we, we have no choice but to continue to talk and to write, and you're quite right, to do so as civilly as we possibly can. Um, I, I have trouble actually getting into conversations or email exchanges with people on the left because all they do is, is assail you with, with vulgarities and, and uh, call you all kinds of names and sometimes threaten you in rather frightening ways. I have been, I've received death threats. I got a call about two years ago a heavily inflected voice saying, look under your car in the morning. And things like that, you know, and not that many, a couple, you know, and, um, and whenever I publish an article on global war warming or anything else on, let's say, Pajam, PJ Media or whatever, I sometimes get letters from the people influenced by the left, which are unprintable. They, and the same thing when it comes to even this, <laughs> This may seem a little bit beyond, you know, beyond this, the topic, but it actually is connected. When it comes to, even to Canadian poetry, I wrote a book called Director's Cut, which came out in 2003, which is a critical look at Canadian poetry, Canadian literature. And I marshal arguments over nearly 300 pages, and the arguments are there to be considered and either accepted, refuted, or modified. Then, I was, I was uh, queried, I was <laughs> told by a friend to look up the major a literary poet, poet, poetic and literary site in this country, which is called Book Ninja. And there I would find some comments about my book. The first one read, Solway is a circus clown. The second one read, please excuse my language, it's there, Solway writes as if he wishes his cock were longer. The third, I went on that way for 50 hits. So I, I stopped after about the 10th or so on. Then somebody sent me the Winnipeg, Winnipeg Free Press review my, review my book. Now they avoided such obscenities. The same thing, though, essentially. Not one single critic, not one, whether on the sites, the blogs, or the newspapers, the Montreal Gazette, the National Public, not one. The New Republic, not one deigned to even address a single argument that I had made and to take even exception to the argument. Richard Just, who was a deputy editor at the time, and I think became editor of the New Republic, also wrote a review of, of my uh, uh, political book, the, the Big Lie. He didn't address any of the subjects. He just called me an Islamic hater and somebody, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know what to do because they don't, they, the left generally refuses to converse with you because they are 
not really a political faction. They are, as you are, I think, quite, uh, quite aware, they are an intensely devout religious cult that believes that anyone who queries what they say should be burnt at the stake, or they should suffer the bonfire of the vanities, and their books should be burnt at the stake, or they should be slandered in the press, or they should be disinvited from, by, uh, from conferences. Lawrence Solomon calls himself the most disinvited speaker in Canada because he's invited to all kinds of climate conferences, and as soon as people find out that he's on the other side, they disinvite him. And we know, we know that's the same thing when it comes to David Horowitz with the problem he has, he has to travel with a bodyguard uh, when, when he lectures at various American universities and so on. So the question, I don't know how to answer the question. How do you talk to the left? The left won't listen, so what do you do? What do you do? I guess you try and persuade the fence sitters. I think that's the only thing one could do. I just may quickly cut in, very quickly. David, I should have written in your contract that you will jump at every opportunity unabashedly promote his book. I'm the publisher, and the, the answer to your question is, we priced this book so that it could be liberally dis distributed. And in fact, we made sure there would be an e-book version of it for all the leftists that like their iPad so much. And it's only priced at $9.99. So, David is correct. They don't want to engage in conversation, so encourage them to read the book for themselves on their iPad for $9.99 and then get it at Amazon.com. Thank you. <laughs> Tristan, Tristan, yes. it's good to meet you finally. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, we're, we're running out of time, so I want all three questions, 30 seconds each, please. Okay. A uh, long time ago, I heard about the New World Order coming in, and this so relates to it. And eventually, you won't have any more cash, we'll all have plastic, and the government's going to take control of everything. And it's starting, too, with our social engineering of our kids, with all day kindergarten, and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger if we don't do something about it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, Rock, Rock. Uh, quickly. I forgot my question. So <laughs> I forgot um, the answer. <laughs> um, it, it was on my emails, it says on the bottom, almost nothing you know is really so. Uh, for this gentleman here, it applies. My understanding that Finland has nothing to do with wine at all. The Vikings went.